Welcome to Chapter 9 of Same Lake, Different Boat, Coming Alongside People Touched by Disability. The title of Chapter 9 is on Grappling with the Great Opportunity. In this chapter, Steph explores the essential question, what is the great opportunity that disability can provide? Well, I can tell you about just another moment when uh, Michael taught me about um, ministry and about, um, well, really about doing the task that God puts in front of you. I grew up a singer, and I was a pastor's wife and a missionary. And for three years when Michael didn't have a school, I was just at home. And he had stopped sleeping, and so I was tired. And just around the clock, I was just taking care of him. And I, I, I just kept feeling like God was asking me if I would serve him. And I thought, well, I mean, I thought we answered that a long time ago. I left everything, and of course I'll serve you. And um, I just kept feeling like he was asking me, will you serve me with joy and thanksgiving? And in my prayer time, I kept explaining to the Lord how I was chained to my house and that if he would send a babysitter for my son or if he would provide a school for my um, son, that I could serve him. And, um, and suddenly I realized what God was asking was, could I serve him with joy and thanksgiving, serving this one little boy? And that what he was asking of me is that I was serving this one little boy with no one else watching and he may never have the voice to say what I had done for him or even what the Holy Spirit had done for him during those hard moments where it was just he and I up all night sometimes. But I realized that a lot of people want to serve the Lord, but it's a harder thing when you let him choose the task. And by loving my one little handicapped son, I was allowing God to choose the task and that he was as pleased when I did that with joy and thanksgiving as anything else I'd done my whole life in ministry. And um, so I, now I see him as my number one ministry. And when I love him, I'm doing the task that God gave me. And um, when I do it with joy and thanksgiving, it brings him a lot of pleasure to see that. Well, first of all, I'd say that, you know, some people would call this an accident. And I think Lynn and I would probably describe it as God's assignment. When, um, when Lynn had cancer before the accident, we would I remember going into what's now our bedroom was our dining room at the time would worship when we went to worship one night and she took her guitar and she had been diagnosed with cancer and she sang the uh, she played and sang the hymn whatever my god ordains is right and she was just singing with a big smile on her face and i don't know if you know the words to that but uh and uh, she was smiling and I, <laughs> tears were just coming down my eyes but seeing that faith and then since the accident, I mean, she she's uh, she's so strong. She's stronger than I am, and um, she's never never given up. I mean, she always is. Uh, whether it's a pressure sore on her bottom that requires surgery or whatever it is, she's she's anxious to go on to you know get that taken care of and go on to the next thing. And um, she's stronger now than she has been since the the. Uh, accident or assignment and um, able to teach children regularly at, at uh, Pioneer Club at night, at Sunday nights. And uh, I just see uh, when uh, the mornings when I kiss her goodbye and uh, caregivers are here and I kiss her goodbye and she gives me that smile and uh, I tell her have a good day. She says, you have a great day. And I see that smile. It just lights me up and gets... Gives me the strength to move on, and um, that's that's God's grace in her life, and um, I see it all the time. I'm thankful for it. We've been married 40 years last summer, and uh, as Pastor Tom said, Mom, he said, "When I grow up, I want to be like Doug Wheeler." And what he meant by that is how many men are faced with this situation and are still faithful and right there. And I believe he has a ministry of his own. I think one of the best parts of that is of the young men in the church. They can see. If they can see what marriage really means, you know, when you say those vows, you say. Health and his sickness, you know, you, you say them. 
what that could mean down the road. And, um, he's not only just faithful, he's, he's, he's fun, he's trying to make things fun. Keep things just as they were, and I, I'm the one that'll complain. So I don't know. I'm not a good wife anymore. I can't cook your meals. I can't do this. I can't do that. He says, I "Think of what you can do," and it's just the same. You know, so um, I praise God for what I do. Well, those were powerful testimonies on those video clips. I. I think those are my favorite ones so far because they're where you can really see uh, the work of God displayed in the lives of these uh, families that were willing to share their story with us. And, you know, when you listen to Angela's comments at the beginning when she said, suddenly I realized what God was asking. Could I serve him with joy and thanksgiving serving this one little boy? A lot of people want to serve the Lord, but it's a harder thing when you let him choose the task. I thought that was really profound. And that's really, really the whole idea of what I want to talk about in this chapter is, is this chapter on the great opportunity. What is the great opportunity that disability can provide? And um, again, how can the church be part of, of helping that opportunity to, to be a reality in the life of a family? Um, I think that there are probably lots of different opportunities that families can have. Um, in, in, in ways that God can work in their lives, and, and I don't want to minimize that in any way. But as I thought about it, I really think there's one key opportunity that, that becomes available to us, and, and that's what I'd really like to, to explore today. I really like this verse from Psalm 119.32. It says, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. And I think that really captures the whole essence of what I what I'm trying to communicate in this, in this chapter. And, um, you know, one, one of the uh, stories in our family life that kind of illuminates a little bit the, the essence of what's at the, the key to the struggle, the struggle of the heart that goes on in this chapter. Uh, Timmy had been at a, a neighbor's house watching the Toy Story uh, one day in the summer, and uh, he was probably about eight years old, and he had been at their house and, and watching a movie and had asked to bring it home. And for a variety of reasons, I had asked his mom not to let him bring it home. So I failed to mention that part in the book. But <laughs> anyway, so she did not, you know, he said he'd like to borrow it. She said, no, he couldn't bring it home. And so he came back home and was a little disgruntled about that. But that was kind of the end of that. And next morning, I woke up and, and Fred was standing there on the side of the bed trying to get me awake. And he said, Steph, Steph, he said, Tim's not in the house anywhere. He said, I can't find him. I looked everywhere. You've you got to get dressed. You've got to go look for him. And so being the, the uh, you know, I say that with a lot more passion than Fred did because he's an engineer. So it's a lot more steady, you know. <laughs> Since I heard those words, I jumped out of bed. <laughs> I was running down the road, like pulling my jeans on because I ran one direction looking for Tim. And Fred took the car and went the other direction because there's a pool near our house. And Tim loves, loved, loves to swim. And he had, at that age, had no fear. So... Fred took off that way. I went the other direction. I hadn't gone 30 seconds down the road before I saw Tim turning the corner from the paved road onto our gravel road that we live on. And, and uh, he was a sight for sore eyes. You know? <laughs> he was wearing uh, his camp t-shirt. No summer. You know, so he had on his flip-flops, his camp t-shirt, his backpack, baseball hat, and boxer shorts. <laughs> so... <laughs> So that was his outfit for the neighborhood, and uh, and as he's, he's as he comes around the corner and he sees me, he gets that really kind of hesitant, surprised look, like, "Hey, mom!" And you're like, "What are you doing out here?" You know. <laughs> and of course, of course, I have that same mixed feeling you have when you know somebody's late for dinner, and first you're really worried about them, and then when they find out they're just late, you're mad, you know. And so I had that kind of that same feeling, like, "Okay, now that I'm not worried about you anymore." <laughs> Where have you been and why? And so before I even really finished asking the, the question, I, I looked down his hand and he had a videotape in his hand and it said FELAC along the side of it. And so I knew he'd been at our friend's house down the road. And they live about a half a mile away from us. And uh, I said, you didn't go to the FELAC's house, did you? And he, he goes, oh, no, 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 no. Well, I guess. <laughs> so so we got back to the house and we start and we start 
really trying to, to impress on Tim why this was such an unsafe thing to do. You know, I was so unsafe to just get up in the middle of the night and walk down the road to the Felix house, and not to mention breaking and entering. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so after we have this, we're trying to have this conversation with Tim, and, and essentially, uh, when, we, when we were all done and, you know, we'd been real serious about the, the nature of this, he, we said, so why was this a problem? You know, and he said, because you don't like Toy Story, and he just burst into tears. And so, so you know, that was it. That was when it became like a head banging exercise for me. I was just at the end of my wits trying to explain to him why this was such a bad idea. But anyway, the the essence of it is that that uh, I think all of us can really identify with Tim. That you know, we know we know what God asks of us in terms of obedience, and yet in the end, we want what we want. You know, we want what we want. And that was essentially what Tim's issue was. That, uh, you know, he knew that he wasn't allowed to leave the house, and he knew that he'd been told he couldn't have the video. But in the end, that, he wanted what he wanted. And, and, and so that's really just a, a human dilemma of our, of our old nature, really, is to constantly be struggling with uh, our will and God's will. And I think... Um, you know, when, when you look at the whole issue of families touched by disability, you know, we talked earlier about this whole idea of, of that on the pathway to acceptance, part of it is this whole releasing of, of expectations, right? Releasing expectations of the life that they anticipated they were going to have and instead embracing fully the life that God has given to them um, to live and, and what that looks like and, and what the grief issues are associated with that as well. Um, and in a similar way, and, and this is where this chapter is a little bit different than some of the other ones, because I think this one is, is one that I really want to impress on you, is I think disability gives us the opportunity to spotlight this particular issue, and yet it's an issue for every, every believer. And that's that, that every one of us um, is called to release our own agendas for life and to embrace God's agenda for our life instead. And, and what is God's agenda for our life? It's very simple. You know, it's Christ's call, follow me. It's follow me. And, uh, and yet most of us find it's countless ways to avoid that call. Um, you know, the great opportunity found in disability is really the opportunity to release our agendas in life and to follow Christ wholeheartedly. And, and some of the, the issues that come up with disability, some of the things that disability illuminates in the life of an individual and a family just make that, that choice more, more obvious. Um, Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor who was uh, uh, killed in a concentration camp in um, World War II. He was a really amazing theologian. He died at 39, and yet this book is so profound, I can't believe somebody <laughs> younger than that wrote it. And uh, he had a quote from Martin Luther in this book, and I'm going to read it. It's a little bit long, but I really I want you to try to, to listen carefully to this, because I think part of of the challenge of this particular topic is that, uh, as my dad says, the Christian life is really very simple. It's just not easy, right? <laughs> and so it's very simple. It's just not easy. And so there's a level which the, the, the more simple the concept, like follow me, the more profound the implications are to our lives. And I think Luther really captures that in this, in this quote. He says, discipleship is not limited to what you can comprehend. It must transcend all comprehension. Plunge into the deep waters beyond your own comprehension, and I, he's referring to God, and I, God, will help you to comprehend it even as I do. Bewilderment is the true comprehension. Not to know where you are going is the true knowledge. My comprehension transcends yours. Behold, that is the way of the cross. You cannot find it yourself, so you must let me lead you as though you were a blind man. Wherefore, it is not you, no man, no living creature, but I myself who instruct you by my word and spirit in the way you should go. Not the work which you choose, not the suffering you devise, but the road which is clean contrary to all that you choose or contrive or desire. That's the road you must take. To that I call you, and in that you must be my disciple. You know, Jesus said, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, 39. You know, discipleship really involves the whole idea of dying unto self. And that's not in order to attain the gospel, but that's really an authentic expression of the gospel in our lives. It isn't what attains the gospel 
on our behalf. It's, it's an expression of the gospel in our lives. Um, you know, God's grace is free and it's lavish, right? It's that there's nothing that we can do because of the gospel that will please God more. And there's nothing that we can do that will please him less. Um, Jesus' righteousness becomes my righteousness and my sin is taken on by Jesus. That's what I believe C.S. Lewis called the great exchange. Um, nothing adds to it. Nothing detracts from it. So it's not, this is not about our works. And yet what this is about is, is having a heart that's so captivated by the gospel that we can't help but, but want to love God more and want to follow him. So you see the distinction, right? It's not, this isn't about earning God's favor. This is about living a life that's so captivated by the gospel that we can't help but want to follow, follow Christ. Um, what does that look like? I, I think, again, pretty straightforward. You know, when, uh, Jesus said uh, the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God, God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, pretty simple, right? Just not very easy. <laughs> um, and that's the, the beauty of that is that we know we can't do that in our own strength. It's so simple and so impossible, right? And so, um, so what does that do? It brings us back to the gospel again, and it causes us to utterly throw ourselves in dependence on God's grace. Um, you know, I've heard it, just the Christian life described as really a cycle of repentance and faith, repentance and faith, repentance and faith. And um, it's repentance from what? Right? It's from the, the sins of omission and the sins of commission that cause us to either neglect or to oppose our love for God or our love for neighbor, either in, in things that we practice or in things that uh, or in our motives of our hearts. So um, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind to love your neighbor as yourself. So what gets in the way of us doing that? Um, it's really our sinful hearts. It's the old nature, the old man, as Paul calls it. And, and it, you know, we're so prone to self-protection, self-promotion, self-reliance, self, self, self. And, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, we don't really want to rely uh, on God's free grace to live righteously. We're kind of like two-year-olds. I want to do it myself, right? We want to do it ourselves. We want to do what we want to do, and we want to do it ourselves. Uh, we have our own agendas. Um, the, you know, the next question that might come up is, well, is there anything wrong with agendas? And I would say that in, agendas in and of themselves aren't inherently wrong. I mean, you really can't live without having uh, things to accomplish. I mean, that is part of, part of life. And uh, humanly speaking, agendas are, are part of being human. It's actually accomplishing tasks. And, and uh, that's the whole idea of the cultural mandate. Uh, in Genesis, I'm going to read you a quote from uh, Nancy Piercy's book, uh, Total Truth. In Genesis, God gives what we might call the first job description. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. The first phrase, be fruitful, multiply, means to develop the social world. Build families, churches, schools, cities, governments, laws. The second phrase, subdue the earth, means to harness the natural world. Plant crops, build bridges, design computers, compose music. This passage is sometimes called the cultural mandate because it tells us that our original purpose was to create cultures, build civilizations, nothing less. So, but what's the key? The key, this, and this is what's interesting, that passage in Genesis comes before the fall. Right? So agendas are not inherently sinful in and of themselves. But the content of this cultural mandate is to be lived out in the context of the great commandment. Right? The context for all of life is, is love for God and love for neighbor. And that's, that's the vehicle through which or the, the center, the core through which everything else that we do uh, needs to be lived out. As Shakespeare said, there's the rub, right? <laughs> because the world's value system is upside down from that, as Keller says, uh, that the, the, the gospel of the kingdom is upside down from the world's value system. The world's value system is upside down from the value system of the gospel. And so, so our, the fallen man in us really wants to have a core or a center that's all about our agendas and that, th that relationships are secondary to that to getting done, you know, our to-do list of things that are important to, to us. Um, it's not too hard to think of uh, examples related to that, you know. I mean, I, I run across them every day in my life. And it, you, think about when last time you're sitting in the line at McDonald's, 
right? And you had to be somewhere in a hurry, right? I mean, you're not thinking about how can I love God and my neighbor? You know, you're thinking how can I get through from station one to station two so I can get out of here, right? And so, so the last thing that's really of any concern in our hearts typically when we're in a scenario like that is, is the care of the person who's behind the cash register, right? It's even in the smallest things of life, we, don't, we struggle with keeping our, our value system in the gospel-oriented way. And we, we're so prone to, to uh, follow the, the uh, value system of the old man. Um, here's a, a, a quote from Bonhoeffer, and it's my last long, long quote, but I think this really helps distinguish uh, when we talk about grace in the context of this, uh, the distinction between what Bonhoeffer calls keep grace and costly grace. Um, and let me go back one point, and I'll show you a diagram in a minute that illuminates this, but we have a tendency in our sinful nature to have an agenda-centered life with relationships that are secondary to that. The Great Commandment calls us to a relationship-centered life that's built on relationships that are built on grace and value. Remember we talked about that in the Image of God chapter, the whole idea of grace in the image of God, grace and value as the, the things that uphold relationship in our lives and that are, again, those are there, but they're secondary to those relationships. That's the reverse value system. Um, and so, so the, the whole idea of, of grace in our lives, keep grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life, and it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. See the, the, the paradox in that? It's just it's really a beautiful, it's a beautiful quote. So what in the world, the content of the cultural mandate lived out in the context of the great commandment. That's the upside down value system of the gospel, and that, which is, again, reversed from the value system of our, of our fallen human nature and the value system of our culture. And our tendency is to want cheap grace, right? We want, the, we want our cake and eat it too, right? We want to be able to, we want to have cheap grace that allows us to do whatever we really want. And yet that's not following Christ at all at the heart, at the heart of the gospel. So what's any of this actually have to do with disability? You may be wondering at this point. <laughs> um, I think what happens is that disability has this way of revealing to us what our true value system is. Because it's very easy for us to talk the talk but not really walk the walk. And I think that, that when disability enters our lives and uh, we, we find ourselves asking the question, uh, is life all about me? my agenda-centered goals, right? Or is it, is it about loving God and neighbor? And, and that can be a real uh, crisis issue, you know, for a lot of people, I think, as they, as they come to terms with these kind of things uh, in the context of disability in their family. And so another way to ask that question would be, what is your, is your covenant with existence? What's your covenant with existence? And this uh, phrase comes from uh, that book I referred to earlier about to Helen Featherstone, uh, a difference in the family. She tells a story in that book uh, where a family had met with a with a physician. They had a child that had profound uh, developmental disabilities, and and he was uh, helping them to kind of get their hands around what uh, what the condition of their child was and what that was likely going to mean in their lives. And and one of the phrases he used in that conversation was, uh, "A child like this is a sacrament. A child like this is a sacrament." And uh, the parents went home and they really reflected on his words, and this is what they said. Upon considering the physician's words, the parents reflected, a sacrament is a partaking of the holy, the truth, the center. To place it in the being of a helpless child is to offer an entirely different covenant with existence. We saw our life and our child in a new light, not as a source of darkness or misery, but as in some way closer to truth and spirit. Um, Living with disability, if you look at this chart, what, what it really gives us is this opportunity to be reflective about what is the value system of my life. Um, what is my covenant with existence? What honestly is my covenant with existence? And, and um, so, so is it an agenda-centered life? 
where relationship is secondary, or is it a relationship where love for God and love for neighbor, the, the working out of following Jesus, um, is central and the agendas of our lives are, are subjected uh, to that. Um, when we, we moved to State College when Tim was not quite two, and, uh, and that was a transfer that I think I might have mentioned in an earlier story, so I don't want to go into it in too much detail other than that was a really difficult time in my life. It was one of my wilderness experiences because um, I really lost a lot of the support system that we had had here um, from having a really uh, effective church family and a lot of really good friends in this area and then moving to an area where we didn't know anyone. And one of the ways that uh, I had kind of rationalized the, my ability to make that move was I thought, well, I'll go to grad school and get my PhD. I had a master's in econ. I thought, um, you can see how irrational that was actually with a two-year-old and four-year-old. But at the moment, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So, um, so I went uh, to Penn State and I took a calculus class for fun. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, 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 and I enrolled in the, I got into the PhD program and I went for about three weeks before I realized that this was just going to be, it was going to kill my family if I did this. It was just not the right time to do that. Um, and uh, it was just a very, very difficult experience because that was an agenda I had been unwilling to let go of up to that. Point. You can call it a dream. It was a dream, but it was also an agenda. <laughs> and uh, and so when it was sort of the, one of those last things that God kind of pried from my fingers up there, and and I did this emotional free fall as a result of of uh, of having to let go of that. And I went through just a really difficult difficult time uh, during those next couple months. And Fred was a very very patient listener to a lot of angst. A lot of times, over and over again. <laughs> Finally, about several months into this, Fred, very, very, and I know it took him a long time to decide to say this to me. <laughs> he, we were riding around the car one day, and he said, you know, I think it's probably time to stop seeking solutions and to start seeking God. And that was, and I knew when he said it, wow, <laughs> that would be a really gutsy thing to say to a mad woman. <laughs> and, but it was exactly what I really needed to hear because I, I really needed someone to say to me, it's really time to let go of the agenda, you know, and to move over to see what does God want to do, you know, with my, with my life. And I can't find the answer to that until I'm willing to take my hands off of the agenda. What does follow me, right? What does follow me going to look like in my life? Um, and, and so uh, that for me was just a really, was a real watershed kind of period in my life. Um, disability, I think, has a way of kind of kicking the legs out under the stool of, uh, um, of a life that's built on effort and ability, right? Because that's what our agendas are built on. Our agendas are, are held up by the two pillars of effort and ability. And so when somebody enters our life and our family or ourselves, because one of us um, as individuals becomes disabled, all of a sudden the idea of, of maybe no matter what you do, the effort would never allow you to attain something anymore, or uh, that, that the abilities that we always valued so much aren't present, right? And they never will be. And so if that's what you've built your life on, effort and ability, and now you have a family member or, or you yourself are faced with these challenges, it really causes you to have to evaluate. Um, it, it really messes with your value system in a good way because it's really, it's really taking the, the legs under that stool and, and kicking them out. Um, the other thing is when you have someone to care for in your family who may have significant disabilities, you, you realize that you run to the uh, end of your rope pretty quickly. right? We realize that we don't really have within us the capacity to love as we need to love on, in our own strength. Um, I think we all, all of us that are parents, realize that just with children in general. I, I remember realizing that pretty early on. I had this little myth that somehow you had enough just affection to get you through, you know, and you realize, oh, not very far into the, into the pathway that that affection alone is not adequate, is not, it's a very small substitute for authentic love. And uh, that the love it takes to, to sacrificially care for somebody who has great needs is, is a love that we cannot conjure up in and of our, our own strength. Our effort and ability will not get us there. 
Um, I just saw a quote on uh, David Apple's Facebook page today. David Apple runs the Mercy Ministry at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philly. And this was from uh, a book by Henry Nowen. It says, we are not the healers. We are not the reconcilers. We are not the givers of life. We are the sinful, broken people who need as much care as anyone we care for. The, the mystery of ministry is that we have been chosen to make our own limited and very conditional love the gateway for the unlimited and unconditional love of God. And I think that any parent who's had a child with special needs can really identify with that, with that statement of being that just that gateway where in, by God's grace, he gives us uh, the power to love in ways that we're not capable of loving on our own strength. Um, when you move from this, from this agenda-centered existence on the left side over to uh, this uh, love for God, love for neighbor, following Jesus-centered existence on the right side, and this is not a one-time move. This is a thousand times a day move, right? <laughs> for a lot of different reasons in our lives. But when we, we make that movement from the left to the right, there's really a, a level of grief that is associated with that. And that's why I have on there identifying with the man of sorrows, because I think there are two, two, there are probably more, but there are two distinct kinds of grief that we experience. The one is when we let go of our agendas that our greedy little fingers you know, tend to hold on to and move over to the life that God um, has called us to, uh, we're really letting go of everything that feeds that self-reliance, self-protection, self-promotion. And, and there's, there's a grief in letting go of what it is that we wanted. Of the, it's, a, it's a grief in letting go of the Toy Story video, right? Um, and, and, and that is not the kind of grief that identifies with the man of sorrows. You know, Jesus did not spend his life tight-fisted around, you know, about any selfish agendas. Um, the, the way that we identify with the man of sorrows is the second kind of grief. And I think that's when, when God captures our heart in such a way that we move from the left to the right and nobody will go with us. There's a grief that comes with that awareness that is something I think Jesus felt constantly. Um, can you imagine being Jesus and knowing what a full life in God is like? Right. And knowing it at the fullest possible level, being a member of the Trinity. Right. And wanting to call us to a full life in God, in God. Right. And that and that following him was the pathway to that, that costly grace. Right. The Bonhoeffer talks about. And yet finding um, that falling on deaf ears. Right. And, and people who were largely indifferent to what he had to say. And even his own disciples only only being able to capture that in the smallest little snapshots from moment to moment. Um, I think there's a, there's a, a loneliness to it, humanly speaking, um, because it's that whole upside down value system that's so antithetical to our, to our old nature. I do want to make one clarification on this. What I'm not saying is that a person should become the center of your existence. Right? When I say a relationship-centered life, I'm talking about love for God, love for neighbor. Um, a, another person, so your family member who has a disability is not to become the center of your existence. It's our discipleship for Christ, right? it, our following of Christ, um, living out that love for God and love for neighbor through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Um, one other caveat, too, is the whole idea that uh, we can make people the agenda of our life as well, okay, and so, uh, so uh, for parents who have kids with disabilities, one of the big challenges can be in this area of advocacy, right? So you can, uh, can say, you, God can get you to move in part of letting go of your agendas and moving towards a, a life that loves God and loves neighbor, and then we can find ourselves very quickly right back to a, a different agenda, right? Sometimes what happens is all we do is switch agendas. This is what all of us do at some level all the time. This is the constant struggle of, of uh, following Christ. But, but uh, for families affected by disability, this is one of the places where I've seen as kind of hyper-focused sometimes, is in this area of, of advocacy. And uh, yeah, advocacy is an important role in the life of a family. It's an essential role. And yet when it becomes the defining agenda of a person's life, then we're right back, you know, <laughs> to where we started. And so uh, it's right back to a life that's built on effort uh, and ability. 
All right, so the call is to live a life that's uh, upside down from the life of the world, upside down from the old man. Um, how, can, how can you help? How can the church, church help? Uh, the first thing is to open your own eyes to the pathway of true discipleship, um, the relationship-centered life that loves God and neighbor first, and, and that agendas are secondary uh, to that. You know, the second is to uh, identify with the man of sorrows and commit to that journey yourself. Um, don't ask the family affected by disability to go alone. Um, we had uh, a uh, little, another little family story. We went to Disney World one time, and we were at one of those character breakfasts, you know, and, and Timmy was really into Mary Poppins at this point in time and so we were to we were to Mary Poppins was at the character breakfast so that was quite the do and and so she came over to the table and Timmy was all you know, all gaga eyes you know and so he was so excited to see Mary Poppins that she came over and she wanted to give him a kiss on the cheek and that uh, we'd been working on social boundaries at school <laughs> so he's going no 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 you know and it, so so she said well she said well how about uh, uh how about if I kiss your brother first? And he said, sure, go ahead. You kiss Freddie, and then you can kiss me. So she goes over, and she kisses Freddie on the cheek, who's being an incredibly good sport you know, about all this. And, and so we have these blushing pictures, you know, Freddie with this big lipstick mark on her cheek. And, and, then, and then she comes back around the table again to Tim. And, and when she comes back to kiss him, he's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. You know, and so he had kind of, he had, he had, Wrote Freddie into this ploy, and then he took off essentially. <laughs> and and uh, oh, anyway, we had a good laugh about it when it happened. But but that's what we do. I, we do sometimes in the Christian life, right? Somebody will say, have a profound experience with God's call in their life, and we say, you go ahead. I'm right behind you, you know. And then we don't go. And that's what that's one of those things that that precipitates that man of sorrows type of grief that, that I was referring to. So I'd really encourage you, don't ask a family affected by disability go, to go alone. Um, go with them. Because it's really, uh, it's really the life to which we're all called. And so um, call others to the journey too. I mean, this is one of those, you can see from these clips at the beginning of this section, you can see when, when God really captures a person's life and they release their agendas, and learn to love as Jesus loves through the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. And that's the life to which we're, the, to which we're all called. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is just share in the delight. It's not all work, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not our work at all in the first place. It's God's work in us. It's, it's, it's that releasing and embracing and, and being open to the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, but it's a delightful experience. You know, uh, Jesus, that's why Jesus can call us to it with such urgency, because because He knows that it's for it's for our good and His glory. And so, uh, another great quote by Luther here. This is a short one: <laughs> "The law is not kept by man's own power, but solely through Christ, who pours the Holy Spirit into our hearts to fulfill the law, is to do its works with pleasure and love, which are put into the heart by the Holy Ghost. To do to do the works with pleasure and love." And I thought that that just re the reason I wrote that down is because I thought that sounds just like Angela's statement when she said um, to serve uh, to serve the Lord with joy and thanksgiving by serving her son and so it's that that exact same thing that holy holy spirit power and that it's not it's not duty and drudgery it's joy and thanksgiving you know it's it's pleasure and love um, so when we when we die into self you know and we live unto Christ I think we're we're really surprised pleasantly surprised um, that we're more fully ourselves than we really ever dared to imagine. When we release our agendas and we really embrace Christ's call on our life, that costly grace of, of following Him. And that's when we can say with the psalmist, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Living with long-term disability can provide a great opportunity to illuminate the entrance to the narrow gate. 
It affords the opportunity to embrace the pathway of discipleship over the pathway of our own agendas, the opportunity to identify with the man of sorrows, and the opportunity to call others to this counter-cultural journey of faith. Please take a few moments to listen to the following interviews and consider the questions posed at the end of each segment. Well, the the hugest impact, and I don't know if I'm communicating it or not, but it really is a huge impact to me how the Lord uses Joshua to teach me and to teach my my children. I mean, I, Christ-like love. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's some some in some ways it's kind of hard to describe that um, you just that he, the Lord uses him to teach me and Camille and my children more about what Christ-like love looks like. And there, there's not as, there's a dynamic that is growing out of self-centeredness with me, with, with, within our family and among our children that I just want everybody to be able to really enjoy the benefits of what the Lord does through those in our midst that have special needs. How does Keith's comment reflect an entirely different covenant with existence. I meant to, uh, I thought of another thing with my uh, children when, right after the accident, and I was just trying to put one foot in front of the other, Julia sent me a, a scripture from Corinthians, and it's one that I um, uh, clung to. It's, um, uh, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not when, on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. And that was uh, that's one of my favorite verses now, when I often try to grab hold of when things are kind of tough. Why does a focus not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, help Doug to live out the path of costly discipleship? There are untold blessings, some of which we've seen and some of which we're, we are yet to see. By having um, families with special needs in our midst, perhaps the greatest of which is I think many in our congregations have really not learned, practically speaking, what the sacrifice of the cross means in the Christian life. And yet our families with special needs children are often forced in a unique way to learn what it means to live at the foot of the cross by virtue of that sacrificial love that is given to a family member where that family member may not be able to give much in return and they are they are dedicated to a life at the foot of the cross and those families have begun to show us what it means to live life uh, at the cross they have shown us in a remarkable way what it means uh, to love um, I think there is a sense too in which they, by virtue of the way they have allowed us as a congregation to grow in our love for them, that they have shown us what godly patience means when we have not all always been what we ought to have been for them. What does it mean to live at the foot of the cross in loving family members with disabilities? <laughs> 